You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and we are here with the man who conquered the Potomac River uh, this past week, uh, Alex Porowski. Dude, thank you so much for coming on 18 pounds to win the tournament. That is that's insane. Um, and guys, on a live stream I'm doing hopefully this Monday. I took an Excel spreadsheet, did a little bit of Adderall, and I compiled all the weights because people were saying like, well, the weights are down. It hasn't taken 20 pounds to win in May and April since like 2018, 2017. So this is pretty much par for the course this time of year. So it's not like the river's dying or anything else. He's He put up some gaudy weight based on the statistics for this time of year. And that that's freaking awesome, dude. Yeah, I think it seemed a little low, the 18 pounds, just because a lot of the team tournaments recently have been... Uh one with 22 23 almost 24 pounds so yeah it, it might have seemed a little bit low but for a, a solo weight i mean i'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to sound braggadocious or anything <laughs> just, I mean, you won you're but, allowed to be right <laughs> no, no it's not it's <laughs> nothing like that but uh you know uh i think i got a lot a lot of luck on my side for that one I mean, and, and the thing with potomac teams too or any team's tournament trail i mean both people's weights accumulate to the same bag. So in theory, mm. those weights would be a little bit higher too than a BFL where you have an angler and a co-angler. Right. I I'm sure there were angler, co-angler combined weights that were over mm -hmm. know, 21, 22, I'm sure. You know, take a take a co-angler or boater's four pounder and put it in your bag and you're like, oh, dang, I should have won that. <laughs> you know, so I think, uh, I think I got pretty lucky though. How did you get started with all this? I mean, I mean, look, looking at your stats on, on BFL MLF.com, you know, you had $13,000 in winnings, two top tens, you have two career wins. Um, but I want to like step back. Like, how did you get into all this? So I grew up in Burke, Virginia and in a, it's, that's a, a town in Fairfax County. And I grew up in a suburb called the ponds. So. As you might assume there's some ponds there and my dad uh kind of raised me fishing those ponds just bluegill you know a piece of hot dog under a bobber and uh like i kind of you know grew up doing that every weekend just with him and you know, he's not like a hardcore fisherman or anything he just like being outside with his son so uh i, I don't know i it just kind of i just kind of took to it and i stuck with it through high school and i uh had a couple friends who liked to fish and you know, we'd go night fishing too. I mean, that was our, our favorite thing. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just, I guess something to do over the summertime, be a bad kid, but you know, use fishing as an excuse <laughs> to get out of the house. And, um, but you know, you started actually catching a few fish and you're like, Oh, this is, this is kind of fun. And, uh, and then I, uh, I don't know, I, I needed a job too. And there was a really cool department store in uh, fair oaks called galleons it was a kind of way back and it turned into a dick sporting goods it's that double decker one yeah yeah so i worked there as soon as i turned 18 and i was working there through college and i thought i knew stuff about fishing going going into that job and i hadn't learned a, a thing i mean my co-workers who i worked with there uh you know they forget more about fishing than i and you know in a day that i knew my whole life you know I don't know what I'm trying to say, but <laughs> I didn't know a lot about fishing until I started working at a, a sporting goods store. And uh, there was a guy there named Dan Gherkin. I don't know if he, he was a big stick on the uh, Fountainhead Bass tournaments. Huge shout out to Dan. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I haven't talked to him in, Jesus, 20 years. Um, but, you know, he, he taught me a lot about fishing, working there for the, the short time he was there. Um, and he kind of introduced me to the concept, at least, of fishing tournaments. And I started going around to like Fountainhead and just watching the weigh-ins and stuff like that. Um, did you ever then, participate in those tournaments? Yeah, I did. It never really went well for me. <laughs> uh, I mean, the bags were big even back then. I mean, that place is on fire now, but oh, you know, it was it was good back then too. It's insane. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you got, I, I just go watch those weigh-ins 
you know, because I live in Occoquan and it's like 10 minutes away. So, I mean, I'm just watching these guys bring like 36 pound bags and granted it's six fish, but I mean, that's still a six pound bass average. It's I mean, so stupid because of where it's located too. It's like if you said the best pond in New York would be in Manhattan, <laughs> like it, it's in the <laughs> middle of it, basically the outer beltway. You know, yeah. and guys, so if you don't, if you're not familiar with the area, I know I have a lot of Tennessee and Northern Virginia or Southern Virginia listeners, you have the inside the beltway and out, I, I call it outside the beltway and like Vienna, for an example, is like on the fringes of that. And then you go even further out then you get Woodbridge and where Occoquan is. And it's really in a suburban area. It mm-hmm. When you drive to the Potomac, none of it feels fishy. When you drive to Lake Hartwell or Lake Murray or Smith to an extent, you feel like you're in fishy places. Potomac, you feel like you're going to get shot <laughs> for a lot of <laughs> yeah. places. But then you have Aquaquan, which has been ranked like one of the best bass fisheries like of all, any lake size in Virginia. And it's so yeah. weird because it's so nestled in there. And they just put out some gaudy bags. Yeah, they do. It's in, it's incredible. And, so then know, going, I mean, going okay. from Dick Sporting Goods, you went, you go for well, basically Dick Sporting Goods. You go from that, which sounds a lot like Iconelli, where he got his start just doing kind of <laughs> getting in there, understanding, learning. I appreciate training. you putting me in the same breath yeah, as. You're uh, welcome, I'm helping you out here, <laughs> helping you out with your branding. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you go from there. Like, when did you make the jump to either a co angler or a boater, or how did that transition work? Uh, yeah, I started. So at the store, a guy named Thomas Harden. He's a guide out on the Potomac. He uh, started working there and uh, he, he bought a boat and he would take me out fishing tournament or uh, just fun fishing for a while. And we would see like, you know, Potomac teams and we're like, oh, you know, what's that? Like, so we talked to Bob Petty and I don't know, it was, it was kind of a gradual thing. Um, another guy who worked at Dick's, his name's Gary Willis. We used to, I don't know, we'd watch Bassmaster on Saturday morning and, you know, have a, have a, I don't know, kind of ambition just to, just to give it a shot. And I mean, we, we started fishing fishers of men, the Virginia division under Steve camp. I mean, that was when Steve camp ran it. It was about, you know, 20 years ago. It's so crazy Uh, how so much of the stuff is connected. It's just so crazy. You keep hearing the same names and interviews and things. Yeah. Yeah. And, and back then the fishers of men tournaments, they were, they were like 80 boats, 90 boats deep, you know, Woo Dave's was fishing it. It was basically like the elite seventies. If you know that trail. Mm-hmm. now um you know back back then so um yeah so i mean we just we just lost tournaments for 15 <laughs> years ago and just you know learn but we we like the we like to travel and try and fish new places even though we got our butts kicked all the time still do well, but well the corporate but, speak for that is you're gaining experience gaining experience yeah <laughs> oh i gained a lot of, of experience <laughs> yeah, it's um yeah, Brian, my friend Brian Werfel, I fished the Potomac teams with him. You know, we, we, uh, the best we can do up here is, you know, get our money back, but the rest of the nation is the donation. So Dude, we go, if we get off the river, we're just donating money. <laughs> but, but you make a valid point. It's where people like in my comment section and stuff, like, why don't you fish the teams? It's like, dude, you can't beat guys that have been on this river for 150 years. It's hard to be competitive. And, I feel like sometimes it would be easier to win a, a regional event versus a local event with just local sticks. Like if you take the local sticks out of the competition, you might have a better shot than when you go to a team's event and you have this team that's been together for 40 years. Like that's, it's hard. It's really yeah. hard. Yeah. I mean, the good thing about the Potomac though, is it does change. It changes year over year, it changes week after week, you know? So mm-hmm. um, you can, you can look into them on the Potomac for sure. I mean, last year, I mean, I, I'm not trying to give spots away or anything, but a quiet Creek was on fire this time of year. Like that was the place to be. Is that, and this is something, I guess, side tangent when I've had people in, in your same position, and this would be cool to get your opinion on this where people say like, I don't want to give away a spot, but I was in the middle of the Potomac and it's like, that's a geographical area. That's not a spot, dude. Like, like you're not <laughs> giving anything away there. Like. It's not like, I don't know. It's just, I've always felt like that's curious. Like I a hundred percent understand like, and I, you know, you can tell my guys, like, you don't have to give away your deep <laughs> guest locations, but if you say mad a woman, it's a, it's like, I caught him in nut right. bush. 
good luck. Like that, that's <laughs> yeah. the size of Lake Anna. No, but, you're uh, not wrong. You're not wrong. I just, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I understand. I understand. You know, I, you can be as broad as you want, but somebody will hit you up and say, quit giving away my spots, you know. So, Dude, you, you <laughs> I can't. tried to premise it's, it a little <laughs> it, It's the same thing with the people. And, I, you know, I swore I wouldn't get into this, but, you know, it, it's fresh in the mind <clears throat> where people will tell you about where the grass is being killed. And it's like, well, you have evidence? It's like, no, but I tell you it's there. It's like, dude, you have a phone. It's called an iPhone. It's got five cameras on the damn thing. Pull it out. Otherwise, shut up. Because in a court of law, no one cares about your opinion. <laughs> stop com stop complaining about like, oh, you're burning my spots. Stop doing all that silly stuff. We're adults here. Um, but anyway, getting getting back on getting back on task. You were still been in the boat with somebody else. And this is a key thing in any angler's evolution is when did you get your first boat? And then you took the helm and you had to start making the decisions. I bought my first boat probably when I was 23 or 24. And it was a 1996 170D Nitro POS. I mean, the Dude, thing, awesome. <laughs> thing was like... I mean, it was crossing fingers and, and hoping that thing would start every time you started it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I fished out of a pretty dinky boat for a long time and, uh, I don't know. <laughs> was was the question? How did, why did I get to start doing it? Well, no, no, just, just, just the how more or less, because we all generally start without a boat and we hop in with somebody else, a mentor or a friend. And at some point we're no longer the co-angler for doing this. We either get a kayak where we have to make the decisions, an electric motor only boat where we have to make the decisions or we get a nitro. And then all of a sudden you don't have your friend there to lean on. It's just you in your mind. Good oh, luck. I, yeah. I mean, I got the boat with the intention of fishing team tournaments. I, I never really wanted to, to branch out and I, I didn't really have any dreams of becoming a pro or anything. I just, I thought it was fun to go fish around your friends and, and, uh, just compete against them, honestly, and just go on road trips and have fun. So then why the BFLs then? Well, I started the BFLs in, in two, 2015, I think it was like the first year I tried it, oh, but really? I, I, yeah, it hasn't been a long time for that. I mean, it's been like, Eight years, I think. Well, that's still um, Chuck James. Yeah, that's, that's not true. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Um, but I, I don't know. I think it was, you know, this guy Brian that I fish with a lot. Um, it was kind of we just did it on a lark. You know, let's let's try it out and see where we can rank. And you know, and we were fishing against each other too. You know, he was a boater at the same time. And I don't know. We we're just trying to have fun with it and travel together and fish new areas. So, you know, I mean, it wasn't really, you know, it was just something we did for fun. I mean, we, we didn't have any like dreams of grandeur where we were going to turn this into a career. <laughs> so. no, but I, I get that. Cause it is, it's, and maybe that's a mistake by all of us <clears throat> where we assume if you're going to get into it, it's almost like a kid who plays baseball in little league as a 10 year old. And we all of a sudden like, so is this what you're going to do in college? Are you gonna make this a profession? And maybe that's what we're all guilty of is like, we see you fishing. We just assume like clearly your intentions are to go pro and not just like stay local and regional and have success. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. It's just, I've always thought that it's fascinating because there's so many people around my inner circle who try to make that a dream. And you very rarely see people who are just like, yeah, I'm just, fine doing what I'm doing. And I, I perfectly enjoy that. Um, and, and if you think about it, really team tournaments is the bread and butter of fishing across the United States. I think more people, I guys, again, you're gonna kill me in the comment section, but I'm gonna assume more people probably do team tournaments than just individual tournaments. I'm assuming through the United States could be wrong. I'll, I'll take that as a hot take, but it makes sense. And there are pros and cons to that. And I think the biggest pro is you have somebody to lean on to bounce ideas off of. I think the biggest con is you have somebody to lean on and bounce ideas off of. And yeah. you fight. I had, a, I, my brother and I fished college tournaments together and it, we were either really good or we we're going to fight each other in the boat because of trying to make decisions like at in team formats. How hard is that to find a partner? A good one. I mean, I, I've gotten along with all my partners. We might have different styles of fishing. I mean, sometimes it helps and sometimes it hurts. Um, 
you know, my current partner, Brian Warfel, he, I mean, he loves to put the trolling motor on 80 and go, go <laughs> and go as fast as he can. I mean, you'll be fishing a buzz bait and I'll throw up past the front of the boat. And, you know, by the time I get it back, it's like, you know, it's already behind the boat. He just, he just gets on that trolling motor and goes. And, um, sometimes that, that works, you know, sometimes they're that active and you're just looking for, for active fish. And, you know, I'm more of a put the poles down, grind it out. We know there's fish here. Let's get them to bite. Oh, oh, I remember what I was thinking about. Um, where did you want to fish outside of Virginia? Where, where did I want to fish or where do no, I? Where do you want to fish? Like best place? Well, my favorite trip that I've taken was uh, Okeechobee. Like I, you I went to Okeechobee. Yeah, I've been to Okeechobee a couple of times, but I rented a boat there. I didn't bring my own. And if there's like a bucket list place to go, it, I, I mean, I would say it's that. And Shiner Fish. I mean, honestly, I didn't think I was going to like it, but my wife and I, we took a trip down there and I rented a Stratus from Roland Martin Marina and we went out and the water was low. So they were like, you can't get on the main lake. You have to stay in the rim ditch. <laughs> so we went out. I mean, we caught a couple fish, but sticking in the rim ditch, even though that guy just won a Bassmaster Elite out of it. It's pretty really, lame. yeah, yeah. He was in the rim ditch, just throwing That's a jerk so bait cool. around. Oh, so this is this year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, no, yeah. When, not when I went, but this was a couple years ago when the water was low. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so, cool. Wait, yeah, so we rented a boat, and I was like, "This is this is sucks." I mean, I don't want to stay in the rim ditch. I want to get out in the you know the monkey box and yeah, and the real kind of fishing. So she was like, "Let's just get a guide." I'm like, all right, fine. So. The guy's like, we're going to fish with shiners. And I was like, oh, I prefer otter officials. And he's like, we're going to fish with shiners. And <laughs> I got a spot. And I'm like, all right, whatever. So, I mean, we power pulled down in this one spot for eight hours. And I swear to God, we must have caught, I don't know, 75 fish. And our best five were 33 pounds. Caught a nine pounder, caught a seven pounder. <laughs> Dude. Dude, it was awesome, man. It was just shiner fishing. So you're just kicking back with a beer and watching a bobber float around. Very sweet. And your wife fishes too? Yeah, she fishes. We actually fished Fishers of Men in, up in Maryland one year, uh, I think 2019. And she's good. I mean, she's she's sick. We got second and one uh, on Bullshit. the upper bay. Really? That's yeah, awesome. On the, on the upper bay. <laughs> we just, uh, I was. We practiced one day. It wasn't that good. I was like, why don't we just try this little marina? I mean, it's a tiny marina. We pulled in there and we, we stayed there all eight hours. And we, I don't know how many fish we caught, but we came back with like 18 and a half pounds. Oh my so, God. I need to get yeah. her on the show with you too. Talk about yeah, what she, like Yeah, couple. she's a stick. She just went back to school and we just had a kid. So she's a little, you know, fishing has taken a, a back seat for her, but. But that's yeah. good because she actually knows like what you have to go through to do this too. Like she gets it. Yeah, she gets it. She knows how how much work you kind of have to put in, how, or at least how much time you have to put in to it to make it work. So, what is she going yeah. to school for? Oh, she's a nurse practitioner now. Oh, dude, that's freaking awesome. Yeah, she went to GW. She's smart as shit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. She linked up with a rockhead like me but yeah my wife um, knows multiple languages and i can't even speak english so i feel really bad about that oh but, really yeah I mean, yeah she's I'm she's an interpreter for a living um a sign language wow interpreter. and it's just like and i can't read like i have not read a single guest name right this whole year and she kicks me for that because of how many like bloopers we have because again guys if you don't know clearly you guys do know because you've seen my freaking like live streams how much of a shit show those are <laughs> uh they're they're edited a little bit that way i don't sound like i'm having a stroke um no man they're good i mean they they sound good you're like the the joe rogan of the dmv <laughs> when it comes to fishing <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and I, I didn't i didn't sign up for that i don't remember when uh, i got drafted to that role i just wanted to talk about fishing in the area because like I, i'll start this because i used to listen to the sports junkies all the time oh and yeah that was and yeah, i mean what would you do you talk about how much the redskins defense sucked and i'll still call them the redskins i don't give a shit it's the redskins <laughs> um yeah. and like we talk about the, the you know we talk about the defense sucks what's going to be like tomorrow we're gonna talk about the defense sucking it's like there are people that passionate to talk about that i bet your ass there are fishermen that would be passionate enough to talk about these waters and just talk about them because i feel like a lot of people overlook them and i think that's a shame because we got a lot of cool places to fish not just 
the, I think the Potomac probably is the gym because of the Bass Masters. Everyone comes there, but you have the Susquehanna. Um, the, when we talked about this, I just released an episode. There's this place called Raystown, and mm -hmm. a guy, they caught 26 pounds to win a tournament there in the spring of smallmouth only. That's insane. And that I've is. never heard of this damn place. And it's within driving distance of DC. And I don't know. It's just there's so many places here that no one knows about. And it's it's a you can become a good fisherman here. And it's not just the Potomac, if that makes sense. You got Occoquan, you got hunting run sure. places like that. Sure. And there's a million small lakes to walk around to. I mean, yes. Millions, millions of them. I mean, if you don't want to drop 75 grand on a boat, just you can go walk around and catch some pretty big fish in Northern Virginia. Yeah. And it's not to just, you know, and I can, I can say it's because I'm not sponsored, but it's not to just shit on boat companies, but if you're a kid and, and this is the thing is like, I, I, I deal with so many high school clubs because of Jake's bait and tackle and they're really big in the high school community. And you look at these kids and you're like, well, how do I get involved? I can't afford a brand new boat. I'm like, mm -hmm. I feel you. It, it sucks. But there's so many places here, like little lakes, uh, places you can bank walk. Um, and the electric motor only tournament scene who I'm going to get some guys on guys to, to talk about that. That's growing. I didn't realize until I went to ICAST last year that the two states that are biggest for electric motor only is Georgia and Virginia. They have the most electric only lakes on the East Coast. And huh. I didn't I didn't appreciate how many lakes there were until you start looking and then you like your eyes start popping like, oh, damn. Yeah, I think like the Hampton area has got a lot of trolling motor only, oh my and, God. you know, yeah. So Richmond area too, a lot of trolling motor only stuff. So, yeah, that makes sense. And if I had my way, I would open up those Baltimore lakes too. Cause that's a crime that you have three lakes right up there in Baltimore that are massive. And it's like what five people can fish it. And you have to give them your firstborn and pay a $10,000 <laughs> a month or something like that. It's crazy. Yeah. It's weird. They do they have to do like a boat inspection or something like that. And then it's California basically dude, it's California. Yeah. Like you have crazy. to buy a boat that can only work in those lakes. <laughs> that's and right. That's I think you have to keep it, th keep the boat there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, but that's the weird. state record smallmouth is from there. Oh, really? Yeah. It's an, I think it's like eight or nine pounds that, that came from, I think it was Liberty oh, Reservoir, shit. I think is the Liberty. one. Yeah. yeah. And then guys, length above my head will be like the article saying whether I'm right or wrong on that. Um, <laughs> and I'll Google that later. Um, going into this BFL, and I, and I guess like I really should backtrack because this isn't your first win. Right. And so it would be wrong not to talk about that. Like, what was, where did you, where was your first win? My first win was on the Potomac. Like, are you talking about where I fished on the Potomac or multiple, let's multiple facet <laughs> when and, and where, so the Potomac, but then what year? Yeah. 2020. That was June of 2020. Oh, geez. During the coof. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that had a little bit of something to do with it because I was teleworking a lot, teleworking, mm -hmm. you know, I have an awesome boss, Mike McGinnis, and he's, you know, he's pretty flexible, um, you know, he, he gives me my, my PTO when I need it. So he understands I, I do a lot of fishing. So, uh, that, that week, like I, I basically was able to fish that whole week, took it off and practiced it and the grass was up, but I, I felt pretty confident I could get like 13 to 14 pounds in the grass, but I couldn't find a kicker fish like all week. So I was like, I'm just hitting hard cover in the, end of june you know I, i'm fishing docks and like the weights were super low that week too i don't, I don't know why 17 um, pounds it took for you to win it 16 pounds second place 15 pounds third place um yeah. that's interesting though so was your plan then to just completely scrap grass in that and guys this is important because i really do think like history plays big on anybody's mind and so in this tournament you scrap grass and said purely hardcover i'm just gonna like just try to win it with hardcover yeah I didn't fish a blade of grass that whole day. Uh, I did have a dock that actually my wife basically found because I was trying to get into a spot. She helped you win. That's awesome. <laughs> Dude, I'm not even kidding you. I was trying to get into a spot and the tide was much lower than I thought at the time. So I was like, I can't even get over there where I want to go. And she's like, well, there's a dock right there. Where else do you think the fish are going to go? <laughs> I was like, all right, fine. So I was all like bitter because I really wanted to fish that area. And she, she threw a jig under it and caught like a three and a half pounder. I was like, all right. I threw a creature bait under it, caught a three and a half pounder. And we went around the dock once and we had like, I don't know, 15, 16 pounds or something like that. Holy crap, dude. So, and that was the weekend before, I think. 
or maybe maybe it was two weeks before. Yeah, because I think it was the same tide. And uh, I was like, well, I'm going to put that in my back pocket. Um, and then, like I said, I got to practice that whole week and I was fishing grass and I could I could catch fish, but I just never got like even a three and a half pounder probably. Uh, so I was like, I'm just going to I'm going to fish this dock and focus on it. And it's kind of out of the way, like it's not like a community hole or anything. And I would check on it every day that week leading up. And I never saw a boat on it. And of course, when tournament day comes around, I go down there and there's a boat sitting on it. I'm like, oh, oh Jesus. Oh. So I was like, well, I got some hard cover over here. We'll go hit that, wait for that boat to leave. And then we'll we'll fish it pretty thoroughly. And so we go and do that. And I, I lucked into like a, a three pounder or something like that, or a three and a half pounder on, on, on a lay down. And I go back and there's that dude is still sitting on that dock. I'm like, shit. I'm like, all right. Well, there's a dock, like there's a dock over there. I, I practice on it, but I didn't get any bites. Uh, but we'll, we'll sit on that for a minute and just see if this guy will leave. Cause I, cause I've been waiting for like an hour and a half. So that guy obviously found the fish on that dock. And I go over to this other one, just trying to wait that guy out. And on my second flip to it, it was like a six, four. <laughs> I was like, oh, shit. dude, <laughs> like, oh my God. Stud. this is not skill. This is pure luck because I had never caught a fish off of that dock in my life. So I look at my co and I'm like, you think we should fish the rest of these docks? <laughs> so we go down the line. I'm just waiting for this boat to leave. My co-angler, he gets like a three pounder. I get like a two pounder and he gets another keeper. And we're just going down these docks that honestly I've I'd never fished. And I had like a five pounder full off. And and then we went back to that that dock and that guy had finally left and we didn't catch a fish off of it. So. <laughs> he's been there for six <laughs> hours, no shit. <laughs> <laughs> but he sat on it. He sat on it in the time it took for me to get my whole bag that day. <laughs> so. Dude, like as soon as you said, like I had one dock, my butt started to pucker. Cause it's like, I don't know if I could trust one dock. And the fact is that no one in the world would hit that. That would be terrifying <laughs> as a game plan going into it. Yeah, oh, no, gosh. it was pretty dumb, honestly. But you know what? I've lost like 50 of these having that same game plan. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, it was when, um, Oh crap. Justin Lucas, when he went on the Potomac and he went up to DC and he had this one dog. Yeah. And to me, I'm still shocked. Like, how in the hell did you have that for four days in a row? And yeah. nobody got on you. Like, it, I, yeah. it doesn't make any sense how it, it's so hard to do that. And that's a community whole dock, too. I mean, everybody oh. knows about that thing. And, Dude. Yeah. But it's big. Everyone. That thing can hold a lot of fish. Yeah. You know, it's it, it, it can. Yeah, but I almost think like there's this weird, like, unwritten rule with that crap, like with the with the elite elite pros, because I don't that shit wouldn't fly in Potomac teams or a BFL level. Somebody would get up on you. I oh, just, yeah. yeah, I wish that I wish that rule. Was, uh... Oh, yeah, I mean, it'd make life so much easier. But so anyway, um, I'm sorry, I, I deleted from your from from this. So, but I mean, sticking a six pounder to begin with definitely calms you down because that's a. I, that's a hell of a way to start the day to start off well, with your kicker. Basically, well, I had like a three. I had a three, three and a half or something like that when so I went close to ten pounds with two fish. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty freaking good. So then, did you call up at all in this area, or did you make a move, or is it just all there? I caught five keepers all day, <laughs> dude. Uh, I had a fish in that bag that was one fourteen on my scale, mm. and I'm telling you, I broke a few off and I pulled off a five pounder that I had like 10 feet away from the boat. So you could have had 20 pounds. I'm sure. Yeah. And, and that's what's so funny. Like when it's your time, it's your time. Cause when I won, I won an ABA and um, I broke off a six at the boat that would have won the BFL the next weekend at that one. But the ABA I won, I had five bites and one of them was on a lipless bait and the bait was on the side of his face oh, and yeah. he never came off. And, and I just kept thinking like in that tournament was, I think it was, that one was early April in 2008. And if he jumped, I knew like he, it's I'm screwed, but he never jumped. He just went down and went down, went to the net. And it's so weird when I think about that to this day, it's like I had five bites and the one that I definitely needed didn't come off. Why the hell did he not jump? And it's just, I don't know if it, I guess it's luck. I mean, <laughs> I, but I think luck also has a part to do with any win. 
but it's also being at, sure. there at the right place, right time and having execution. Yeah. I mean, you controlled the fish, you got them in and did your job. You got the and, bite. I and mean, exactly. And you got the bite too. Like you could have just left the area, but you didn't. And that mm. got you the six pounder. Yeah. I was just, I was lucky. Never caught a fish off that dock before. I was just waiting that guy out, honestly. <laughs> and then, so that gave you 17 pounds. You, you win that event. And I think that's huge. Your very first win, because it, 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 I think immensely it tells you that you can play with the boys, you know, you for better or worse, you are a good angler, uh, just to have that first win and get that monkey off your back, so to speak. Now, I mean, it felt good for sure. <laughs> but, yeah. But I mean, I'll tell you going back, you know, when you, any tournament where you lose fish, especially good fish, you, you feel like shit, <laughs> but you know, yeah, the check helps a little bit. It eases the, the pain. Checkup. Yeah, it, do it does. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, I didn't really, I didn't feel deserving of it for the way it went down, but you know, I was totally grateful for the, the blessings but I got. You, you sure. got this win and this has been my kryptonite is where I want to fish history with this win. And now, now we're in 2023. Were you ever since that first win trying to fish history too much, or was it easy for you to just basically clean your mind and fish clean? after that win uh i mean if you're asking if i go back to those docks yeah I like have... are you more like <laughs> through grass i'm just a dock guy now no no okay. you gotta fish grass um it was just like a weird kind of changeover time at the end of june where yeah there's a lot of fish in the grass and they're biting but just finding the quality it was just it was really hard for, for me that week anyway um so you know in practice i got a couple bites that i shook off and i was you know, I, if, if those bites were, were two, three pounders, I'm in the same position as I was in the grass, but maybe they're better bites. What in your, if that makes sense. You... But, but uh, well, also we, we had practiced it a couple, my wife found those fish. So, <laughs> you know, I, I knew at least that dock, you know, had, <laughs> <laughs> had some good quality on it. So, so yeah. then what, but you had a gut feeling like it wasn't working in the grass. Can, can you pinpoint that feeling? No, like, I mean, like I said, I had the whole week to practice it. So, um, I don't know. Like, I guess in my head it was, what's another loss? <laughs> Roll the dice, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, how many wins there were because of that, that you actually do that and you gamble? Like, I mean, that, that there's been a lot of tournaments that are won like that, especially now that the mag draft is becoming more of a thing in tidal waters and things like that, where people are, I mean, I tried to eat that in a tournament bit me in the ass, but then again, yeah. you would look cool as shit if it works out. So it's like, yeah, maybe that's what you have to do sometimes to get the win. Yeah. You hear a lot of good things about that mag draft on Smith mountain, but I can tell you I've burnt a lot of time trying to find a, a mag grab bite down there that had never formulated for me. It, when I fished high school tournaments, it reminded me of some of the old guys that would just lock a jig in their hand and they would either come in dead last or they would win and they'd get their five bites. And that's what the big swim bait bite feels like. I think, I think there are some people out there that like understand it, but for me at least it's, I feel like it's an all or nothing kind of deal for a kicker bite. Yeah. Yeah. No, now, I'll, I'll throw it. I like to throw a Huddleston around. I like to throw trash fish, you know, all the trash fish. Weird. I love trash. Dude, fish. Trash fish is pretty sweet. Dude. Some, yeah. some pretty yeah. decent bites on that thing. It's great for ponds too. Honestly, if you want to get a kid into a swim bait, throwing something like that, a small version, the four, the four inch, I think is what it is like around some of the ponds mm -hmm. in the area. That thing's fantastic for that. I didn't know they even had a four inch of it. Yeah, uh, they got the they got the bigger versions, the big dong ones, but um, they got yeah. smaller ones, which I like to use in ponds. Because again, like it, guys, again, I know go tangent about that, but that that bait has been so much fun to throw um, as a kid growing up, and then into adulthood teaching kids about like, yeah, just slow roll this thing through the through the grass, through the shoreline vegetation, and you're gonna get absolutely smoked with it. Um, but I digress. L leading then into this tournament, like. Talk to me, just your mindset going into this thing and, and how you approached it. Yeah, so it was kind of a weird week because we had water temps going into this week. Um, well, I guess last weekend in the high 60s. And it was like, a, there was a cold snap and got out there on Friday. I had one practice day. I was like, man, this water is like 62, 63. So it's definitely a cold snap and... Um, 
so right away i was like i'm probably gonna have to slow down wherever i fish i'm probably gonna have to slow down um and i really thought that there was a couple creeks we already mentioned chickamauks in wanaco there's good grass and there's like four on the whole river <laughs> well no there's fish everywhere on that river yeah. man you get if you know you can you can name every creek and somebody's got a good bag out of there this year oh well, my dog is uh have you ever wondered how much money's been won out of Matter woman and chick and things like that like it's got to be insane i i mean i wonder how much money's been won out of Matter woman when the person hasn't even started their outboard <laughs> that's my question um i'm, I'm doing something not to give that. away a spot but um uh, yeah that area no, can be good it's just because i was before we were recording i was going through like Bassmaster and flw like the bigger tours and there's been somebody in the top 10 every time almost that has that has made it out of Matter woman mm -hmm. and that to me is just it's stupid where it's just like you literally like you said don't crank your engine and you have a chance of still cashing a good check for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, there's just thousands and thousands of fish dropped off there, you know, every season. So then there's a lot of bait in there and there's a lot of habitat. So why leave? No, I mean, that, that is true. <laughs> but then like, and, you when, said, and when they get weighed in, they move 50 feet <laughs> from where they were. <laughs> so. Oh, and that's the thing is when people tell me like people from out, out, out of state are like, well, where do I fish? And it's like, honestly, that middle part between Belmont, Matter Woman and, and the rocks at Leesylvania, just stay there. Like you can't learn the river unless you live here. It, it's so freaking hard to really mm -hmm. learn this place. And I think that's why tide is so hard because if you fish a place on slack tide, you won't get bit. You have windows that you need to be at that place to know if it's good or not. Um, I mean, oh, yeah. do you think that's kind of right or? Yeah, the water's got to be moving one, one yeah. way or the other, you know. I mean, if it's a slack tide, then try and find some current. I mean, if you can't do that, then either drive for 30 minutes or where the tide's starting to either come back in or wait it out. But yeah, I mean, there's there's certainly times during the tide where it's just, you're not going to get bit no matter what you do. And it, it makes it hard. But then, but, but then, like you said, go, going into this tournament, you, you, you approach the practice. You ran a couple of different. I'm going to kick this dog out of this room. Yeah, you're fine. What type is it, by the way? It's a plot hound. A plot hound? Yeah, it's a. Get over here. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're fine. There you go. Oh my gosh, you're adorable. Her, her name you're is like Croy. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's why I didn't get to name the baby. Let me kick her out. <laughs> I'm sorry. I have a border collie. And oh, really? yeah, so and that's why I have I have a studio that's separate from where he's at because he gets very upset when I'm not in the room with him. She's learned how to open doors like a velociraptor. <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, what are the nice people online saying? Oh, people are really pissed at me. Is it live? No, it's re it's pre recorded. Oh my god, is it backlash from the catfisherman? Instagram blowing up about people thinking I'm I'm too hard on commercial fishermen, which it's just like. You know what? I literally message all these people and be like, hey, listen, if you'd like to come on the show and talk about your point, you can. Perfectly <laughs> fine having other people's opinions on the show. Like we I had the DWR guy on for the Flatheads and Blue Cats. Mm -hmm. And I just launched an episode with a blue cat charter. All he does is catfish. I was like, yeah. why do you like catching these things? Like, I don't care if you want to come on to have your opinion and I'll be respectful, but it's, it's so funny. But then when you ask people to come on, they're terrified <laughs> to put their opinion there. They want to, they want to complain, but they don't want to like make a difference or back their opinions. I got you. That to me is fascinating to me. The doc talk is crazy. Yeah. The commercial fishing issue. It's just, I don't know what's right. And I don't know what's wrong because you know, at the end of the day, like, I respect a, a person's right to make a living out there. And, you know, I don't really know how damaging it is, but I could tell you if I was in your garden and I went through and I Carl spacklered it from Caddyshack with a rake and I chopped off the top of your flowers, it's probably going to fuck up, you know, what happens to the bees, right? But yeah. And this is the comment that's starting to piss me off in everything I'm posting is, well, it's, it's, they're not breaking any laws. It's like, you're right. But in night, 
up into 1960, you were perfectly legal allowed to beat your wife. I mean, it was legal. <laughs> I mean, like, I mean, like, just because it's a law like the is, rule of thumb, you know, that's where that comes from. Yes. <laughs> Hitting your wife with a switch that just can't be thicker than your thumb. A little creepy that you know that, but okay. I won't no, judge yeah, there, but uh, <laughs> full, of, full of useless knowledge. But yeah, it's just like, so I hate it. It's like, well, it's legal. It's like, well, should it be? It's like, okay, I agree. Like, it's legal, but maybe we should look at the books. Mm. Like, I, I don't know. Like, I, I, I just think that's a, it's such a cop out thing to say, like, well, it's legal. Um, but I don't yeah, know. It's, it's a weird issue, too. I mean, because their argument can be, well, they're going in and they're sticking fish that are trying to spawn and, you know, they're moving them all around the river. And, you know, yeah, it's I mean, I can't imagine that's more damaging, but there is some damage, you know, that we're probably doing as a result of that. But. I don't know. We're also not ripping up habitat and killing everything <laughs> that that our you know hook hits. Uh, and and that's the that. thing. I, I had um I've had fuck. I had sixty people text me today, and I had six phone calls, and it was the DWR and a couple of fishing guides. And the biggest thing I come up with is this: difference between a fishing tournament and a commercial thing. If allegedly, if this mm. is true, the commercial thing will rip up aquatic vegetation, which is habitat. Bass fishermen do not do the extensive damage that commercial fishing will allegedly do. And so the problem is, unless you do a study, it's all hearsay. And I think that's the biggest issue is in a court of law, it's just us saying they do more damage. But the fact is, if it is true that they're doing more damage, subaquatic vegetation on the Potomac River is actually protected by federal law. Hmm. And that's the loophole. But then here's the funny thing is no study's been done. So you're saying that you protect it federally. However, you don't know if this thing that you also give permission to do will actually hurt it. Right. And it's such a weird gap in the system. And yeah. so is it, and I think the issue is people don't want to know the truth is kind of where it seems. Cause it's so weird that there's not a study done in this one gaping hole in the system. Mm -hmm. But that's been my whole day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sounds fun. Oh, sounds God. like a fun day. I'd rather talk tournament fishing than, than this stuff because I don't think anything will change. But I'm also a cynical asshole. So. <laughs> well, I guess to get back to the tournament. Yeah, I mean, we had had cold, cold weather all week. So the water temps had dropped like seven, eight degrees. And I knew it was going to probably have to slow down. And, you know, I went into those two creeks and I noticed that the water was just muddy turned up you know chunks of grass floating everywhere and i was just like man i don't i don't think it's gonna happen in here so uh, you know fortunately i've got a lot of experience out on the belmont region and i have a, a couple of spots out there and 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 truth be told all the spots in belmont have, have been changing they've been changing every week so i didn't know which one was gonna hit now um, to, to, to lay the table for everyone if i may the weekend before um, there was a bunch of tournaments going out there. I think it was a Potomac teams. If I'm not mistaken, there mm -hmm. was supposed to be a battle of the borders, but it was like insane on Sunday, the weather wise. Yeah. And I think there was about 400 kayak tournaments also going out. That <laughs> um, maybe five. Maybe there, five. There, there was a few. A and so that place got pounded. Now, yeah. did any of that factor into your decisions on where you're going to go because of the pressure the week before? Uh, I don't know about that because the Potomac just gets so much pressure. Okay. I mean, I mean, most of the spots that I fish can usually handle, it, I guess. Do we ever think um, that as anglers? Like, oh, shit, there was a big tournament. Like, it's not going to work now. I, maybe. I don't know. I don't know because it just keeps all those community holes just keep putting out fish. Yeah. I mean, week over week. Um, so m maybe you try something different in those spots, but the, f the fish are still there, you know? Yeah. And that always gets back down and not to go down another rabbit hole. We're going to get to the tournament guys. I know, but it's just like when it talks about boat ethics and I've had this conversation with some really good people and it's like the Potomac river is the asterisk because like you said, there's community holes. This is where the fish are. What the hell do you want to do? Like. The rules of the road on Kerr or Lake Anna are not the same for the Potomac. I just don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know how else to describe it, but that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, if if you were on 
Lake Anna, like any pick any lake I'm in Virginia, it doesn't matter. You would never put your boat down a cast away from somebody else. It would you know, feel weird. That, like in on the on the bank they're going down. Like mm-hmm. you would never do that. But on a grass flat in the Potomac, you know, come on in. <laughs> you know, and like, people have no shame in doing it. No, it does but it doesn't feel weird either. Like even when you described the previous term, the guy was on the dock, you would scoot into the same dock as him. It just, right. it's just like, you just, it would be weird, but the grass flat, I might, I, I might not think twice about scooting into a grass flat with other people. It's such a weird mm. thing that when it comes to grass on the Potomac, you'll go bumper to bumper. A lot of yeah. people will and not think about it. Yeah. I mean, I think it's about how you go into it. You know, if, if you, motor down outside of the grass flat and work yourself in with a trolling motor. It's a lot different than idling with your nose up and oh, not, <laughs> plowing through, you know, making a mud line a mile long. Like, you know, I feel like those people are more acceptable <laughs> to fish in close quarters, you know, instead of just powering down off the plane right in front of you. you know? So, but so then, no, it, it, it does, <laughs> better worse, especially when uh, the Jersey people come down, that's for sure. Um, oh man. <laughs> that's fun isn't it? <laughs> when that northeast division comes down that's, that's a rowdy group uh, i love you guys don't kill me um but you're okay so belmont bay big community hole you know it's going to get pressured to hell yep do you want to be seen out there then practicing the week of or does that not even go into your mind i mean you're not doing like camouflage after dark kind of stuff when you're figuring it out right no i i mean i'm i'm practicing out there but i'll probably I, I don't practice the juice as I know it or as I think it's going to be, but I'll try different areas that maybe haven't fired off yet just to see if I can have a backup plan. And the backup plan, I mean, dude, I Friday was like well, the worst day of fishing I had all year. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So that's like, I mean, it told me for Saturday, slow down, you know, pull down the fish are here, just wait for them kind of thing because I was going, you know, I was trying new stuff on Friday and none of it was working. So then I'm like, well, maybe I'll try just a little of the stuff I know. And then that wasn't working. And I was like, oh, maybe I'll just go to the juice to get a confidence fish. And like that wasn't working. So I was like, ooh. Um, so. so you're not feeling great going into Saturday. No, so I'm feeling <laughs> horrible, honestly. Like, I, I mean, so and I'm like, I think I think my best shot is going to be in the pads. I've been catching a few fish in the pads, you know, the last couple of weeks. And, um, so I'm That's both seven old decision. I mean, I like fishing pads. I think it's fun. Uh, there's almost always fish in them. They might not be giants, but I'm like, I know I'm, I'm going to catch a, a medium li- limit and then spend the rest of the day. Like, <laughs> no <laughs> no and just like my brain's working is like so when i fish pads in the past and it could just be me it takes a little bit more time to catch limit in pads versus maybe grass or a dock situation to where it's like okay so in my mind it's like well then how long do you are you going to give yourself leash to run this thing before it's like oh shit i need to go to plan b like was that in your head at all or uh yeah i mean okay. it's, it's it's this is also time of year so okay this time of year i Maybe not in the middle of summer. I probably wouldn't have as much confidence in the pads, but okay, gotcha. you know, this is where they spawn. They... I didn't think about the, I, I thought the lily pads were insane because I think a willy, lily pads can be a waste of time. I feel like you can spend, and I, again, I'm used to fishing lily pads in the summer. And that was like, I would go up to uh, Lake Chautauqua and places like that up north for college tournaments and you fish pads mm-hmm. and it's like, yeah, it's great, but it's like, it's like, fi- it's like punching. You'll spend 500 cool. hours doing it and eventually you find it. And so my first thing is like, oh, shit, he's going to waste a lot of time doing that. But then you're like, well, no, not in the spring. Right. And that's I did waste a lot of time doing it. <laughs> you were right. Well, you're not supposed to say that. Part. <laughs> so I just say like I went up there in the first five casts. I had 25 pounds and it was no, we were good to go. <laughs> I did not. I did not. I man, I was all excited about it because I had the right tide. The water was high. I, you know, I could, I could move my boat around without stirring up mud. And honestly, there weren't many boats in it. So I thought I was going to yank a few out of those pads. And I got one that was maybe 13 inches. And I, I did spend an hour and a half, two hours doing it. Uh, so, I mean, at that point, I'm like, 
I got to bail on this. This is not working out. And I, I went into a marina. I caught a couple keepers and uh, one was pretty decent. One was in my final bag. It was about three pounds, you know, just, oh, wow. just a marina up in, in, in Occoquan, you know, it was like not really loaded with fish either. I have forward facing sonar and I'm looking around and I, I can see some, and there's a lot of, you know, smaller fishes, tons of bait fish in it, but just, Usually we do see a lot of fish in it, but you know, it's tournament day. So of course not much there, but I got lucky. I spent an hour up there and I got, I took my, my three pounder and maybe my 16 incher. And I just went back out to the community holes and put the poles down and, and slowed down and honestly grinded. And I, I didn't do anything special. I mean, I just threw a Senko around and drug that around and, you know, chatterbait and, fish the chatter bait as slow as I can without getting it bogged up in, you know, the, the grass that's not that great out there yet. So, um, so for the people that are listening, um, that on Apple, iHeart, places like that, you, you start in the pads, then you, then you decide that you're going to give up on that plane. You go to the Marina. Then after the Marina, then you're like, then I'm going to go to the community holes. Is that about right? Yeah, pretty much. I hit a couple spots on the way out of Occoquan after the Marina, but there was nothing doings there. Yeah. How are you feeling when you get to like, I guess now you're in more of the community whole area of Belmont. Like, how are you feeling mentally? I it's square one, you know, I could have caught that three pounder in a community hole, you know, before And I should say, I didn't start in the pads. I, I did hit a spot on the way in. I don't okay. know if I made that clear. I did. I did catch a couple of keepers doing that. So I did have four, I think keepers when I was like, I got to go back to the community holes out there. Um, but I wasn't feeling great. I certainly didn't feel like I had anything special going on. But, you know, in fishing, there's a lot of luck. And I fucked a Cinco out there as far as I could one time. And I I, it, I, I don't know, man. I, I threw it much deeper than I would normally throw it. And I, I won't lie. I saw marks on a forward-facing sonar, which I didn't think really makes a difference in shallow water fishing i've had it for a year now and i just i don't know this last couple of months i've actually found some utility in it out there um but i thought I what have. i <laughs> was that i said i have it yeah. works I mean, but, it, but in shallow water i mean in shallow water i i am using it more on the potomac let's say than i thought i was yeah I, 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 i'm hard. the same way i'm, I'm the um, same way because that I just never saw much. I thought the whole last year I was using it in shallow water, especially forward facing. When you have it on scout mode, it's, I mean, it's pretty sweet. You can see a lot of logs and, and rocks that you haven't seen before. So, mm. But maybe not good for targeting individual fish that way. But when you have it in forward, if you can differentiate the grass and the fish, it can help you. And I'm, I'm just starting to kind of see the difference between the two. It's weird because it's almost like the Matrix when 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 Neo finally got to see past the veil. Because I feel like after a while, and this is what my friends tell me that I've had it for years. Eventually, the data starts making sense. You keep staring at the <laughs> screen, and eventually, it's like it all hits you. Because when I first and I was a dumbass, because when I got it on my boat, it was like the day before a tournament. I picked it up and I get there, and I'm like, "Holy crap! There's fish everywhere. I'm gonna win this thing." Right. And it's like it's not that freaking. Sense. <laughs> it's not it's not and it is it's just another tool and it can yeah. it can help you out and it can burn you because you can spend time on the wrong shit <laughs> a lot of times like um I'm, I'm still learning what a what the difference between a crappie and a bass and a catfish and a yes. carp and a, you know it, they all look the same to me i mean if they react to your lure maybe it's a bass if they don't uh, maybe just keep moving on <laughs> you know <laughs> What what are the distances you like? Because on online you have some people like, oh, I'll set it like three hundred feet or something ridiculous, and other people are like, keep it short. Do you have like a happy area that you like to keep it in? Eighty feet, eighty okay. feet is mine. Yeah, same Z's. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, if you got like crystal clear water and you're fishing deep, maybe you can extend it out to a hundred. But still, I mean, a hundred feet, it's probably not going to get that much of an accurate cast on it anyway. So, eighty's just 
Maybe you can. I don't know. I maybe I just suck. True. <laughs> but, no, 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 no. That, that makes sense. Uh, but but you made such a great the thing that I highlighted in my brain noodle was when you said like I just took that Senko and this one time I yeeted it as far as I could. Yeah. Well, eighty feet because I saw these marks at like eighty feet and I was like, that's got to be catfish, right? Casting distance <laughs> is so important on the Potomac. I really. So I mean, this is not a secret, guys, and I've blown this up. I fish a lot of saltwater spinning tackle on the Potomac because I want casting distance. I really feel like when I'm in these grass flats, I want to power pole down and get the bait as far away from me as possible. Get mm -hmm. distance. Um, I feel like it's hard when you're in these community grass mats to tear it up with your trolling motor and just pitch a foot away from the boat, especially when you don't have mats quite yet. Um, and I just think that's interesting that you also try to keep distance between you and the fish as well. And I think a lot of times people forget about this on these community holes that you still want to keep yourself as distant as you can. Yeah. I I mean the majority of the good fish I catch out there all right. It's distance. Yeah. They they put it in your heart your heart slumping out of your chest cuz you you said you're like oh god there's so much grass from here and there that you can wrap oh god, around yes. and like but the majority of those big fish usually come off a long cast. When you leaned into that one did you know immediately? I told the I told my co-angler don't worry about it it's a catfish. <laughs> I swear to God, I swear to God. <laughs> and then that thing came up and I was like, it's not a catfish. It's a funny it's catfish. <laughs> uh, so he, yeah, yeah. So he grabbed the net. It, it took a long time to get in. Honestly, I was like, this is, it's not going to happen. <laughs> it had me wrapped around grass, had me wrapped around anything I could find out there. What, what were you using? Like an ultralight with four pound test? Like what were no, your, no, I mean, I use a, I use a Senko with a, uh, eight pound fluorocarbon but i use a 10 pound basically backing of braid okay you know i, I do florida braid um but yeah i mean i can i can i can huck it out far enough with that and it's strong enough i i don't go six on the potomac anymore <laughs> i used to i used to think that makes a difference but and it might it might might get you more bites i don't jury's out on that one Sounds like but, a story there of why you finally <laughs> <laughs> story about losing a lot of fish. <laughs> but uh yeah, no, I mean I, I I feel like eight gives me a good chance to, you know, to to get them in and get the bites. So it's oh, personal that, that, preference, you know. Yeah, but that's so fascinating to me because it's like finesse just always plays so well on the Potomac, like the shaky heads, the sinkos, the drop shots. I mean, like it, it's and people again from out of town, they're like, all you throw is a chatterbait here. It's like, you know, there's a shit ton of money that's won on finesse stuff. It's sure. like it's but your brain can't comprehend when you think grass and flipping and stuff, like, oh no, it's spinning rods a lot of times too that play. Dude, I had a I had a BFL out there one time and my co-angler kicked my ass on a drop shot and he was using a 164th ounce weight dude it was like <laughs> it's like a, a grain of rice <laughs> it was it was he's like <laughs> i'm sorry i misspoke 116th <laughs> okay, yeah. big 116th. big boy but that's like you know obviously twice the size of a one eight or double the half the size of a one eighth so i mean that thing is like still a grain of rice Mm -hmm. I'm like, does that even help you cast? He's like, I don't know. I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you might just weightless at that point, but dude, it, it was just, I don't know. But he kicked my ass on it for sure. We overthink the Potomac so much. I mean, we really do. It's not, it's not overcomplicated with the baits. I mean, every now and then you get a guy to, that will actually do well on like a spy bait or something like that. But, you know, usually it's just the bread and butter stuff and you're just grinding through these places. And it, I don't know, that it's so fascinating to me. It really is. Um, because I, like the kayak tournament was so funny. I had I had two winners on and one said he practiced practiced all day in a choir and couldn't catch shit. And he wanted Matta Woman. Mm -hmm. And then we had a guy that practiced a Matta Woman said he couldn't catch shit and he wanted an choir. And it was like <laughs> a Saturday, Sunday thing. Nice. And it's like, it, it, I don't know. It's just that to me is so fascinating. and. I don't know, like the river's big and you just got to literally get on the right fish at the right time. It's just, that's, yeah. that's, that's what it's all about. Yeah. I mean, that's basically every tournament, right? <laughs> it is. <And> like, <laughs> how much of it is the bait though? <laughs> like I, I always like, I don't know because I, know. I mean, so many times you come back in and come back into a tournament way in and people are like, I could only get bit on a chatterbait. And like, I threw a chatterbait for like four hours a day. I couldn't get a sniff on it. And 
you tell that guy you caught all years on a swim jig or something like that. And he's like, yes, I threw a swim jig for four hours. And I couldn't get bit on it. So it's like, you know, <laughs> who can call it? Right. <laughs> so would you rather be at the right spot or have the right bait? Oh, I'd be at the right spot for sure. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know that, that to me is like, cause the whole chatterbait thing, like my friend gave me shit. Cause like the past tournament, he beat me by a couple ounces, but I was throwing it chartreuse crankbait and he was throwing chatterbait. He's like, well, mm -hmm. the chatterbait's the best thing. It's like, okay, yeah, I know you and your 500 friends throw that, but there's like other things that can work too. And I don't know. That's what's so weird about the chatterbait. I, 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 I don't know. Maybe it's because I feel like it's too hip right now, but at some point <laughs> is the stock going to drop on that thing? Like, holy shit. How long can you be the number one bait in a river system before fish are like, dude, I know what that sounds like. That sounds like it's coming right back at me. It's like, yeah. I, I don't know. It's just, that's crazy to me. I lose a lot of fish on a, on a chatter bait. I don't know if, if you have the same problem and I've tried a lot of different rods and I think I've found a good one. Just St. Croix, like glass rod legendly but i i don't know man a lot of times i'd rather i'd rather fish soft plastics that i think get bit off of just because i they stay buttoned up but they do they yeah that's so weird like i do have that problem i had that problem with crankbaits for a long time until i kind of like experimented with my setup because i feel like we get too especially at the end of the cast if it's too mushy i feel like you don't get a good hook in them it's mm -hmm. so weird to have that perfect balance between if, if it's too limp, I feel like you can't really stick them good. Yeah. But if your rod is too stiff, I feel like if they make a jump or something like that, it tears out and like, yeah. So I don't know. That's why it's such a weird lure to me. I lose a lot of fish on it because I don't know what the right rod is and or line or anything. I just really haven't figured it out. I know I can get bit off. of it. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. the good thing about it, but I do lose a lot of fish on it. How and heavy do you like your chatterbait though? Three eighths, almost always. Uh, half ounce if there's really sparse grass or if you're fishing deep, but almost always three eighths. Interesting. Yeah. I've heard people use it in three fourths too. And it's like, how the hell? What are you doing? Are you dredging a trench? Like it makes no sense, but I guess you're getting bottom contact. Yeah. And I'm speaking strictly. Yeah. River. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, I guess if you're like on a lake or something, fishing a point and you want to bang it off rocks maybe go deeper or maybe go heavier, but I don't know. I, all I know is river. <laughs> so. Well, and, and you do it this day. And so that's a transition, but you, you <laughs> land this fish here. That's in a little bit deeper water at the end of a cast using forward facing sonar. You got a limit, but mm -hmm. this is not like a 10 pound fish where you're like, holy shit, I just won. Like, where is your mind? Like, I just filled out a limit. Now I go head hunting or like, I'm feeling pretty good on the day. Uh, I mean, pretty much immediately after that, that five, two, I mean, I'm not really thinking about it. I'm just still fishing. Uh, I catch like a four pounder, <laughs> like right? Like within five minutes, the five, the five, one and a four pounder came within like five minutes of each other Dude. on the same spot. So, <laughs> I mean, I'm like, oh shit. Actually, I have a bag now because I had a three pounder off the marina and I've got like a couple of other 16, 17 inch keepers and a five and a four. So I'm like, but that was pretty much it. Like that was at 11. I don't think I called up again the rest of the day. And that was all in the same area? Uh, well, I mean, I had the marina fish and then, you know. You weren't running two hours. You weren't milk running, I guess, um, if I could say. No, the, like, the, like I said, when I went into practice in those two creeks and I, I didn't see anything I liked, I was like, I know Belmont. I'll just take my chances. We've got a good tide for it. Um, I'm, I'm just going to do what I can in there. And I, I knew I had like. 17 18 pounds and i thought it was good i i thought it was top 10 so i mean i didn't quit <laughs> i kept fishing i missed one i missed one on a grass flat on a chatterbait that was gonna help i had because i think i had one that was like two and three quarter and that one was definitely like three three and a half pounds came up they were hitting a chatterbait funny that day they were they would smack it and then they'd run right at you like, so mm. it, it was just, I couldn't button up on it to, That's interesting. You know, to what we were discussing before. I had that. There's a lot of fish on it and like, it sucks because it gets a lot of bites.
that same day I had a tournament on the upper Potomac, uh, the upper Bay. And it was a nightmare because every damn fish did the same thing. It would like what you would flip in because you were, it's like the Sabine river. There's like six fish in a whole thing. But so the <laughs> bites were rare, but every time you'd flip in and you set the hook and it would run at you like a snakehead, like oh, every yeah. time. And there was no way you could crank fast enough to come tight on them and you'd lose so many. And, but the one that was hooked had a bloody tail. And I really wonder if that has to do with like a spawn thing. And this is more of just me metaphorically speaking, like the thought process, but it's so weird. Like at that time of year, they're running at you because I don't really remember any other time of year where I have this. I had that habitual problem where they, they all were coming to me. Yeah. Um, that's just so, that's so weird, but you did it. I yeah. Mean, I mean, I would guess fish that do that are protecting a bed and they're just grabbing whatever they can on your lure and, and pushing it. And it's, yeah, it's probably not your hook. It's probably your trailer and they're just getting it off their shit. And that's why you're not hooking them. And that makes sense. And, mm. and then like a lot of times, you know, this time of year you hook fish in weird places. Like you were saying, like the side of the, the mouth because they're just moving it and mm -hmm. they're not eating it. So you, you might hook a fish on the side of the mouth because they got the trailer. And you, when you rip it, you're like hit them in the side. Oh, the right. That's, that's, so, yeah, that's actually a good point. I didn't even think of that. And, and then was, was Belmont just packed to the gills too, or did you have it to yourself more or less? I wouldn't say I had it to myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be a pipe I I, yeah. I mean, you know the, the river's got a lot of fish but one of the problems is you know it's if you find the bass boats you find the bass i mean it's you know the fact of the river well, um, and that teaches you to protect things though so you mentioned pulling down i did this in the terms i've done well and it's like i get to an area and i just pull down and when i catch one and everyone converges on you <laughs> I just pull down and i deal with it and be like listen they're gonna leave this is the juice all right. I'm going to let them wait for them to disperse, but I'm not going to get off this casting lane. Yeah. Did you do any kind of gamesmanship like that? At all? <laughs> it's funny. Is it? So I got, I got to my first spot uh, where I got a couple keepers off of, but I got there, I got my line and like I'm boat 17. So I got there early. I pulled down and like two boats come in like right after me. And they're like, they do the circle thing. Like they know they yes they yes. know the spot and they're just like circling around and, vultures and <laughs> yeah, it was pretty funny like one's waiting for maybe the other boat to give up on waiting for me but like I'm I'm gonna stay there <laughs> mm -hmm. and like the worst thing for them is like they have to watch us catch a couple of fish and you know <laughs> then they get discouraged and they go on with their whatever yep. their other line so. Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, it is a little bit of, of defense and, you know, but that's a, that's a fact of it. Like for the kids listening, like that's important. It's like, you don't have the whole lake or river to yourself and you have to think about like, okay, it, when you, let's say examples, like you caught that really nice one. Does it go through your head? Like, okay, I'm going to power pull down here now. And I'm going to sit this out. If there's a lot of people around me, cause like, this is the juice. I need to like, see if I can get a few more fish. And I, I think a lot of people like that's, that's something that you need to entertain as a thought is what's my next move now. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'll milk a spot. I mean, if a five <laughs> comes from a spot, mm -hmm. I'm probably not putting those poles up for a while. I mean, I'm, I'm going to sit there and I'm, you know, and some people will ask, like, can I fish this spot? And like, I don't know. Depends on how you feel for the day. Like, if it's a BFL, if it's a VFL, I might be like, I'd really respect it if you if you let me have it. And, and you know, if I'm out there, I'm fun fishing. I'm like, just go on through, do what you gotta do. But you know, I like when people ask. They've got a they've got a fifty fifty chance <laughs> if they ask politely. You know, Otherwise, do you see that a lot? Or is people, it rare? People who ask. Yeah, it, I mean, it depends on the spot. If you're in a if you're in a you know big grass flat. It, I guess you don't see a lot. Um, Sadly, I always have to ask that to see like what people are like, like about asking about that stuff. Um, no, I mean, dude, like you did a great job and um, I can still hear you. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry. You break um, but um, anyway, like, so, you know, you have this weight, you go into weigh in. When did you know? Was it literally when they called your name or when did you start getting that gut suspicion? No, I, like I was the first flight. So I had to sit there <laughs> from like two forty five to four fifteen. Oh, dude. And I never had a gut feeling that I had it. And I was like almost praying just like, let it be done. Like, 
let the next guy have a bag that beats mine so my stomach starts hurting and just get it over with. Uh, yeah, I, I never thought I had a one, especially with the end of the day. Uh, I think low tide in our area was like 2 o'clock or something. So it was like people are going to get the, the water moving back in. The good, you know, right That's when the punch. tide turns. So yeah. I was like these people who get an hour and a half more of fishing, probably going to sack them up in the afternoon. So mm -hmm. I never thought I had it. I, I thought I had a bag, like a top 10 bag, but I never thought I would have had that win for sure. I, to be fair, what's more shocking to me looking at the data is your first win. There was still somebody that had, you know, it was close to you weight wise. Mm -hmm. um, but in this event, it's like it was 1613 in second place. Like that to me was the most shocking thing. Like oh, there's a lot of 16 pound bags and that was a hard number to bump up from. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think fifth place tie, there's like a three place or excuse me, a three way tie for fifth place at 16 even. Yes. Was, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I mean, there were weird weights, but like I said, the couple of those creeks got pretty gacked up by, you know, events that <laughs> were out of their control. So we got to we talk about it. It's, <laughs> I think that helped my way. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, 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 but, no. It's like we got to talk about it because if yeah. I would get more comments about it now if I just kind of annoyed, yeah. uh, avoided. But it, that's a fact of life, and it's it, one of the reasons I think I got lucky in this tournament is that what happened on Friday? I went into Quantico, and the water was all muddied and shitty. And I was like, yeah, this doesn't look good. I, I practiced. I mean, I got some bites. I shook them off. But the there's some grass in there that's good. It just didn't look good. And then I went over across the river to a, it's it's not a very well-known creek, but it's called Chickamuxin. Uh, you know, I mean, some people who, well, fished, no. <laughs> if, if you fish the river for like, you know, 40 years, you might have heard of that creek. But Maybe once if, or twice. If not, I'm, you might be learning about it now. Uh, <laughs> I went in there and I like th there's been good grass in there since February 50 years. Oh yeah. That too. Yeah. Yeah. This well, me starting this year. Since, um, and I looked around and I was like, man, this looks like garbage. I mean, I, I wasn't getting a bite and like the commercial guys were in there and they were just finishing up running their nets through the whole grass mat. Uh, the whole like left side, they they tore up. I mean, there's floating grass everywhere. The water was all muddy. Where it was like clear maybe a week ago, you couldn't see like two inches. So mm. I'm like, man, I'm I'm writing this whole creek off just the way they they muddied it up, they shitted it up, and it, I mean the whole to me like I kind of like have a, a water clarity I I really enjoy, and it's usually like a green tinge and. It was it was not going to happen, and I was like, even if you gave this thing a couple of days, I don't think it would be where it needs to be to to have confidence at least. Now, pe people caught fish in, in that creek. I promise you. I mean, good bags. I, I don't know where like the rest of the top ten came from, but I'm I promise you. Or, I mean, I would feel comfortable in betting a lot of you know whatever that some of those top ten bags came out of Chickamauxin, but. That was my deciding factor when I saw it on Friday that I wasn't going to run in there and try and make that work because it was just tore up, tore up. So that's why I decided to pretty much spend all day in Belmont. So it probably affected some people. And, and again, guys, like we're going to delve into that more, you know, on the channel. And again, for for any commercial guys that are out there, um, if you would like to be on the show, because I would really like to get. Uh, to get your side of the story. I would really like to give you guys the opportunity to be on here. I'm very respectful for this. I've had both sides of the argument with the blue catfish, the flathead catfish issue, the snakehead, like all the issues I try to get both opinions on, but you know, I, I can only do so much. So please reach out to me so I can have you on the show just so you can say your piece. Um, I'm also going to get ahead of the black bass commission to talk to them about this, to see what's going on with this. Um, Cause optically, I guess it does not look great. Um, so, but here we are and i think it did affect people it did affect their decision making it did rattle them a little bit and i guess i'm more shocked that there weren't more boats and maybe i'm wrong more boats in belmont no there's plenty of boats in belmont <laughs> there's still was plenty of boats in belmont okay good yeah oh yeah 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 there's plenty i mean aquia mad woman chickamucks in quantico and belmont bohick they're all gonna have 
a lot of boats in them, like every tournament, basically. And there's nothing you, you can't get away from that pressure. Um, and you didn't, and you tamed the river with 18 pounds, which is amazing. And you're going into, I guess, the next tournament, which is on Kerr, correct? You're going down to Kerr? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Donating. <laughs> you say donating, <laughs> but you might keep the juice going. You don't know. Yeah, um, you never know. On a roll. What What made you want to do this? <laughs> do what? Fish Kerr. Piedmont are Division. Fishing, are you fishing all of them then? Uh, regionals on the river. So. Ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> that's the I, only that's the only reason i would subject myself to two cur tournaments and a high rock and a smith dude. mountain <laughs> oh you went to high rock we're going to high rock oh you're going that's to high after rock. Oh, Kerr. I gotta, yeah that i gotta get this up now that one's brutal results smith you did the smith one then too didn't you yeah you don't have to look at that one. Oh, yeah too late um <laughs> it's like it's bad dude what happened <laughs> Yeah, these lakes eat me for lunch. What what is with that with river rats and being able to just basically pay their mortgage on the river, but they get outside of it and it's like, oh, this water is deeper than five feet. Like, I don't know, I don't know, but I think it's more like optimism, maybe because on the river, you know, the tide is going to turn, and you know, if they're not biting now, you know, they're going to bite maybe in the future. But on the lake, if they're not biting, you're like, uh, they're never going to bite. <laughs> That's I, my mentality. <laughs> no, preach it. I <laughs> I've fished seven tournaments on the upper bay and they've literally gotten progressively worse until last week. I basically couldn't pay for a ham sandwich. It sucked. <laughs> and it literally was because it was so in my head after I got to my first spot, I wasn't getting bit. I kept telling myself like, you're going to bomb this tournament. Uh, yeah. And that was my first mental state. You put me on the Potomac and I'm like, I, I kept going through the same area and I think it was Pohick and eventually i caught them and my mind was the whole time like well they're going to turn on eventually yep. and i grinded i did my thing and I, and I caught them i think i finished fifth in that thing nice. but then i went to the upper bay and the same situation and my mind was literally like you're about to bomb this thing and then i i mm. made a huge run which was retarded and it cost me the tournament but it's so weird it's like they're both tidal waters but one is so in my head because i've had bad experiences there i i couldn't get out of that weird funk yeah and yeah, there's and a I, mental I agree with you too for for sure. Yeah. Hey, so what's going, what's going on with the upper bay? I, I've heard it's been off like pretty much all year. So there's just not. So I ran. Is this another this, uh, commercial fisherman drama situation? No, it's not. It's that, <laughs> luckily, ripping, no, it's not. Are they ripping it, that shit up too? It, it said there's not enough fish. Hmm. Like, and that's what. So uh, you brought this on yourself. So I'm going to bring this here. So I'm going to show you an example of what I mean. So I basically got all of the data. I'm working on this for my live stream, but let me pull this up here. So let's just go to the results here. So this is the results of the bay. Okay. 20 pounds. That looks amazing, right? Look down here. Once we get to, uh, let's go 77th place. Look at how many people blanked. It's not good. <laughs> it's that's still no, going that's no <laughs> that's northeast division that's that's the chesapeake is there is i think what it is on the chesapeake you have a lot of older fish and so you'll have two or three guys that'll crack 22 pounds but there's not a lot of a fish population hmm. there anymore because if you go up to like lake, a lake champlain there is so many fish literally everyone catches six limits at that point, it's who catches like one or two bigger ones. The Potomac, in a lot of ways, I think is that way, where there's a lot of fish somehow in that river system. The Chesapeake, there's just not, I think, a lot. And you had two major fish kills there. Um, I think it was, in guys in the comment section, help me out. I think it was like 2015, 2017, the year after Aaron Martin's won in Middle River on that dock. Really? And then there was one a little bit earlier, and it killed a lot of the fish on the lower half of that. And so all you have is the flats the Susquehanna yeah. flats area. And it's very good. It's a lot of fun to fish when it's on, but it's like Okeechobee. It's a bowl. And if the wind blows or the tide's not right, dude, it's, it's hard to fish that area. Yeah. And so, but then we launched, I think it was in like the, not the, we lost launch in Dundee, which is about a 40 minute drive up to the flats on the bay. And so, I mean, yeah, it, I lived in Baltimore for like five years. It's basically Baltimore. 
Yeah. You're driving up from Baltimore all the way up. Okay. Um, uh, which is quite fun on your equipment. Um, <laughs> was but, kayak? Did you say kayak equipment? No, no, no. My, oh, my boat equipment. Like I, oh, I, okay. I busted a bolt on my trolling motor going up. I shouldn't have gone up. I should have stayed local all the time. That's how the guys did well. Is they sat in the back and there's these these canals that are freshwater because most of it's salt. It's like the mm -hmm. Sabine. It's literally like the Sabine. You're back there and there's striper, trout, and bluegill and sharks, and eventually you'll hit enough fresh water and you'll catch a bunch. And I, they kept pushing the bait and I was getting, I was worried I was going to gag it. So I was like, let's just make the hour run up to the flats. Well, it's already like 10 o'clock. That was stupid. I shouldn't have done that. I should have stayed in the area and probably grinded it out. But I was in my head that this place is going to kick my ass again. And I wasn't disciplined enough to stay. And it was mm. so funny is if I was on the Potomac, I would have stayed knowing like I would get my <laughs> bites. I'd stay. And, but it's, it's a, t they're both tides, but that place now just, it, it, it's eating my lunch. And <laughs> I don't know. I feel for guys that like they could go to the lake and they feel that I think the same way. It's like, oh, well I can't win here, but right. it's all, it's all up there. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. That's interesting though. I mean, I, I, if I were you, I mean, I would have ran to the, to the flats too. Or, or the marinas up there or, or something. I mean, I but would... you stayed on the docks, right? You also stayed. You didn't leave that one tournament you won. Yeah. You, ma you made the smart decision. Like, I got to stay. But that was still a long run. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> but you didn't leave. <laughs> like I said, there. I caught one in Potomac Creek. So I was running. I was making runs. Dude, that but... ninja one. I have not heard from that. Ever since that Italian guy. What is his name? Like uh, Gagliardi Custard or <laughs> you know, whatever. <laughs> Lely. Yacopo, yeah, Yacopo yeah, Kalele? yeah. When was that? Was that like three, two years ago? I think it was two years ago. Yeah, he was Potomac Creek. Yep, yeah, Potomac yeah, Creek. Yeah. And then I think the last time Ninja Boy played was when Skeet Reese won out of it. I think. Yeah, Way I, back I think time. Ninja Boy. I don't know. I've never fished it honestly, to, to tell you the truth. But I think the salinity got a little too much for it. It's banging for snakeheads. It's really good for snakeheads. Oh well, um, then maybe it's not too. Uh, but I think they breathe air or stuff like that. Well, that's, that's a, true too. But that's yeah. Are they swimming but, around in the bay though? I mean, like the Chesapeake Bay. I caught can... two, actually, uh, in the middle of a flat. I almost, I think I hooked a redfish because I snagged something and it basically burnt <laughs> my gear hard. And I, I've done that before, where you go to like a Lake Murray and you're fishing a swim bait, and all of a sudden you get trucked by a forty pound striper, and it locks the shit out of your bait caster. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. Uh, yeah, dude, it's so much fun. Yeah. Um, but you know, I don't, I don't want to take up all of your time tonight with everything, but you got, you got Kerr back on the schedule. Any thoughts about that? And, and kind of what are your plans for this year? Try to survive and, and get to the river and in, in the fall. <laughs> that's, that's my, that's my, uh, game plan, I guess, you know, if I can just keep it in the top 50 a couple times, maybe I'll get there. But I, I think you will. I think this is your year. <laughs> I don't know. So that tournament was Shenandoah division. I'm not fishing it because i think their regional is down at murray or something like that hartwell oh. murray Jer jordan what is like north carolina or south carolina lakes it because that makes sense <laughs> yeah I mean, whatever I, I i mean if i have to fish high rock to get to the potomac i'll do it but just just grit your teeth and get through it i actually i mean when i go to high rock i'm like i i really like this lake i the way i like the way it fish there's there's like wood everywhere it's all there's a lot of shallow stuff and last year i was practicing it i went to this one wood stretch and i like caught a four pounder or four and a half pounder on like i don't know my first couple casts and i was like oh it's gonna be on and then, like i didn't get shit for the rest of it not not only for practice but for the rest of the tournament <laughs> like, and it was embarrassing too i was paired up with dave williams who's like a river stick and like maybe i can show him like i can fish with <laughs> the big boys <laughs> i just couldn't do shit. i think i got like one one bounder and, but he did really well i mean he he got like top 15 or something despite my terrible <laughs> boater fishing i guess dude no uh, you're gonna get there it just takes it you gotta get out of the comfort zone of the river and and branch out a little bit but you'll get there hey i'm i'm good with this i like to go fishing i i i can totally uh embrace the fact that i have a lot of shortfalls in it i just enjoy doing it and, and traveling around and you know sometimes that sucks for co-anglers but <laughs> <laughs> now i would i 
I would be remiss if I didn't bring this up. You are are riding in a boat that I don't think a lot of people in the area know about. And I think this is fascinating. So I want to make sure you get a plug for this. Like how to tell the story to the audience. Like, how did you get with the Falcon? Because it, it, it it's not like a big like a Ranger, I guess, or a Triton Nitro, like one of those I, OG original ones that you see everywhere. Like Falcon's a newish company, correct? Yeah, they're out of uh, Newberry, South Carolina, and um, they're they're gaining some traction. They've got a couple of pros. Brian Latimer is one of them. I think Scott Canterbury might be one of them. Anthony Carl G- 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 Yeah, Car- he just jumped on last year, and uh, and uh, um, Gagliardi. Uh, they're they're some of the big. But I got mine from uh, John Hunter, and he's an MLF pro. He's on the the. BPS tour now, and I don't know. I saw one at at uh, Lake Anna one time, and I was like, the the deck on that is is enormous, and I'm just a super goofy, lanky idiot who needs a lot of space. So I saw the deck of that boat, and I was like, ah, that's that's the one I want. And uh, so I, I reached out to John Hunter, and you know, I made it work. You know, but uh, they're they're cool boats. I mean, they're a smooth ride. They're they're big, they're heavy, they got a lot of storage, and I mean, it's it's perfect, especially if you're a bigger bigger guy, you know. The one thing that really I like cool. about it that's kind of, I guess, weird is is it looks like it has enough battery storage where you're not, like, cramming batteries everywhere. Like, there's plenty of room for more batteries because of the size of our electronics. Is that about right? Oh, there's so much room back there. I mean, I'm running lithiums, too, so there's just, like... Really? Yeah. Well, uh, for, for my trolling motor, for sure. Dude, that's oh, wow. the that's the deal. Is it? I'm, I'm telling. I have lithiums with a powerful charge. Oh my god! I you you can honestly fish out of that for a week without charging it. And that's not a plug for any battery. I have no sponsors. Look at me. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> but you can you can run days and days off of one charge with a powerful charge and lithium batteries. That's and, cool because I, I don't know a lot of normal guys that are running like lithium and and a power pole charge. So it's kind of cool to hear you say that, and you're yeah. not like a billionaire getting paid by them. So that's kind of no, cool. no. And they're and they're it's a uh, three fifty amps too. So it's not mm-hmm. even like the thousand dollar each batteries. It's like you know, basically the price of an AGM battery. So which ones are you running? Uh, Ionics. Yionics or Ionics? I- okay, it sounds like a I- weird hint. Uh, thing, sound, but... Yeah, that sounded like, a, <laughs> like anime. My, my big fat Greek battery. Yes. Know, I'm about, but... Dude, but that makes okay. Okay, cool. So that makes a lot of sense. You're saving some weight there with that. Um, and then the last thing about the boat, I want I, I want to hit on. It's got a funky rod, uh, like a rod storage latch. Is that gimmicky? Like, what's the point in that? Kind of awkward on the water. If you're, if you're, if you've got like, you know, six rods sitting on that locker, uh, super awesome when you're off the boat. So if I want to reach in and go get my rods, I don't have to jump on the boat. So for what he's talking about is the rod locker opens up like that instead of opening up like that or that. Mm. So, so it opens up like that. So I can grab it from the deck of the boat and I can grab it from the outside of the boat. if I want to get them off. It's kind of neat. Okay. It's a good idea. I like it. But yeah, if you you got to tie you got to tie him down if you're um, getting it while you're on the boat because you can flip them flip them off the boat. Oh but, shit. I but that's kind of that. the same way as if you know you had a an outward, you know. That's that's true. If you're goofy that's enough, true. you lose a rod on any boat, right? So. And then are you running a Mercury or Yamaha or or Yeah, it's a Pro or XS250. Or Pro XS. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I think it's just fascinating cuz like there's so many I just I haven't I haven't had anyone on the show before that's run that brand before. So I think that's good for if you guys want to know. And again, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today. Um, is there any other uh, sponsors or anything like that that you would want to give a shout out to? No, just a, a big thanks to my family. You know, my mom and dad, and they've they've been garaging my boat for the last 20 years. And, <laughs> you know, because Northern Virginia it's fucking sucks to Dude. get boat storage. Uh, so I, I appreciate that. And, you know, I, I appreciate my wife. Uh, you know, we just had a kid together and she's been taking care of the baby. And, you know, while I'm off chasing some stupid green fish that I'm, <laughs> you know, so uh, thank her. Thank her. Thank Brian Warfel, my tournament partner, everybody, all my friends. You know, I got all the friends to thank, but we could be here all night for that. So 
No, but... sorry. I know this has been an awkward interview, and I'm not a I'm a socially awkward person, so I appreciate your patience. Dude, dude, today. this was fantastic. <laughs> um, I, you know, I hope there's a couple portions of this that are usable, but um, I, th I I'm think doubting, he... <laughs> I'm doubting it right now. <laughs> everyone, everyone always does, but uh, no, that this this was a really cool conversation, and I guess the last thing would be, um, and I ask people this question, which is like, what are their goals for fishing? But you being a Northern Virginia guy, it's it's different. If you won the lottery, where would you want to live? Because I don't think a lot of anglers like would like to live in Woodbridge, so to speak, or down in the heart of the city. Hmm. I mean, do I have to stay regional or like anywhere in the world? You, you get your tickets to Bass. I get my ticket. Yeah, wherever your wife will let you. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I got to imagine somewhere in uh, either Florida or Texas. Ooh, okay. Yeah. You know what? I I've I've kind of fished a few places in Florida, so I'd go with Texas just to roll the dice. But like Sam Rayburn area, Lake Fork, I I, I want to fish those places so bad, and I just um, a living, and I, and I would love live, living in Texas. I mean, that place is what still as close to the Wild West as he can get. So. I watch Milliken's videos, and he's just catching like fifty pounds worth of fish. It's oh, just insane God. there. It's like it's almost cartoonish. Oh, it like, is. <laughs> you know, it's, it's world. It doesn't seem like real life. It's like no, unbelievable. They're dinosaurs. They're absolute dinosaurs down there. And like, yeah, that is a bucket list. I want to go fishing there. I don't know if I'll ever get to live there, but yeah, definitely bucket yeah. listed to go down there during the best time of year and seeing what I can do. Yeah, for sure. What about Alex, you? So, what would you? I, I'm going to hit it back to you. Go for it. Um, probably South Carolina would honestly. I mean, if, if I didn't have this show and everything, I, I, in college, when we had so many tournaments down there, the blueback lakes are so much fun because you can fish them year round. Mm. Texas lakes, they have a hot time and then they kind of fade off oh, Florida cool. lakes, Same thing. You can go down to Lake Hartwell, Lake Kiwi, Lake Murray, and basically fish them 20, 24 hours a day, 12 days, 12 months, of, 12 months a year. That's about right, Tom, 12 months a year. And you can catch them. And that's what I like about it. And the Potomac even has its time. It's hot. And then it's like, eh. Oh yeah, August and September. They're 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 terrible, but you go down there, it's like, oh, it's top water in July. Big ass cane walker, go out there, catch 25 pounds. It's the yeah. middle of winter, you're gonna go for spotted <laughs> bats, you're gonna drop shot and underspin, and you're gonna catch like 18 to 20 pounds. Like, and that's like to me, it's like, but it's it's different on the same lake. You get to fish so many cool different new styles. Yeah. And yeah, then uh, my sense. my vacation place is I always want to go to Lake Havasu in Arizona and catch those um like 20 pound bluegill. Uh, yeah i saw that the guy what was it like it seven pounds or something dude it's like a freaking dinner table yeah. it's awesome that thing was ridiculous it, it, and cool. you catch that on a four pound test like <laughs> oh my god yeah or throw your bird your bird lure up into the reeds is that what how aaron martin's yep, that that's how he did it i just remember the bassmaster episode where they had like the graphic of the bird sitting in the nest and pulling out and then like some bass would come up and devour it. I, I don't know how he figured that out to this day. Like the idea that he figured out a blackbird yeah. pattern he in, a, in Savant. <laughs> I mean, they don't make him like him anymore. Just no, everything, no, like even his, his drop shot leaders. Uh, he talked about like everyone fishes the drop shot leaders too long and, and he fishes them super short, mm -hmm. um, like a shaky head. And, and that to me was like very interesting because when I was fishing a drop shot, I always thought you wanted like a 20 foot leader on there. And then he would talk about like, no, it's like a shaky head where it's like, it's super close to the bottom, but then it can bounce. Mm -hmm. You can have that tight little action. And it's just, but he somehow figured that out. Like mm -hmm. his mind worked like that. Yeah. It's a strange man, but best fisherman, I think. To Dude, ever live, he, honestly, he, he was, he was one of the legends. He really was. Yeah. Um, Alex, again, thank you so much for coming on the show and congratulations to your win. Link in the episode description, everything we talked about today, guys. We might be talking here, but uh, this episode is over. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.